So I'll go ahead and get started, even as people come in for the last, for the next, uh, if they dribble in for the next minute or two, we can still go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us at our session on LINK, the LSST Interdisciplinary Network for Collaboration and Computing, where we will be making some very exciting announcements today. Rachel, if you could go ahead to the reminder slides. Thanks. So as you all probably know by now, you have agreed to abide by the Rubin Code of Conduct. And if you want to review that Code of Conduct, which I recommend every once in a while, go to the workshop website and you can um, remember what it was that we all agreed to. And Rachel, the next one. Also, please be aware, as you saw when you joined, that all talks are being recorded and this video will be posted tomorrow. Um, in terms of this meeting, look, um, this workshop, remember there's here a reminder that for Slack questions, you can give a thumbs up and our moderator will then um, know that several people are interested in that question. Today, you can submit questions either to the Slack channel or on the chat and, our, and uh, David McFarland, who will be moderating, will be looking at both of those chats for questions. So feel free to do that. Um, go ahead with the next slide, Rachel, thanks. So for more than three years, uh, some faculty from a handful of LSSTC member institutions and I have been working on a massive undertaking. Our goal has been to uh, obtain or create resources that would be needed by the astrophysics community beyond what the, those that are provided by the project to fulfill LSST's full potential. And then to provide those resources to the community in a broad way. So we've re received help from many individuals, um, received help and input from many individuals, also from the full suite of LSSTC member institutions and from the science collaborations. And thanks to this broad effort, and now thanks also to major gifts from two private foundations, today I'm very thrilled to announce the launch of our, our massive endeavor, which is LINK, the LSSTC Interdisciplinary Network for Collaboration and Computing. So the speakers today will go through different aspects of LINK. Anne Zabladoff from University of Arizona will start us off with a brief overview of high level what is LINK. Then Rachel Mandelbaum from Carnegie Mellon will talk about the funded LINK software program. Then Adam Miller from Northwestern will give us a review of the LSSTC Data Science Fellowship Program, which was part of the inspiration for aspects of LINK, in particular that involve training and community. Andy Connolly, um, I'll speak a bit about a software, I mean, a postdoctoral fellowship program. Then Andy will pick up and talk about LINK community engagement programs, in particular engagement with the LINK software program. And Adam Bolton will then conclude by explaining how Noir Lab will help support the community in having access to the resources that the LINK Endeavor will provide. And finally, David McFarland will run a Q&A. So Anne, why don't you take it away? Thank you very much, Jenna. We are indeed very excited to uh, announce the launch of the LINK initiative. Uh, LINK is working with the LSSTC Corporation, its member institutions, the science collaborations, um, all to assist both the building and the sharing of analysis tools for key LSST science drivers. Um, in addition to that, LINK, as Jenna mentioned, involves the training and mentoring of future scientific leaders in our community and facilitating uh, through both of those ideas, uh, broader access to the discovery space. So for a much uh, larger and, and more inclusive group of people. So 
Uh, as you all well know, if I could have the, the second slide, please. Uh, we have an enormous opportunity with LSST. It's a unique, spectacular photometric data set over the sky and over time. Um, and we want to use it to answer some very big science questions in cosmology and large-scale structure formation and evolution and the astrophysics of compact objects, the origin of the periodic table, the formation of our own solar system and that of others, uh, and even the potential menace of Earth-crossing objects. Uh, but to answer such questions uh, and those that, that come along that we can't even conceive of yet, um, we're going to need to build on the LSST data set. So for example, uh, as you know, LSST is going to measure millions of objects that change their brightness every night. And we are going to need additional means, additional I mean, I'm not to, know, <laughs> to know which I'm are the most- I'm not on camera. To know which are the most interesting um, to follow up uh, with other telescopes before those, those transient events fade. Furthermore, uh, LSST is going to show us uh, the X and Ys of an incredible number of galaxies on the sky, the R index, but we're going to need uh, additional approaches to measure the galaxy distances and get true three-dimensional maps of the universe. And LSST is going to show us a movie of how objects move in the sky from night to night, but we will then need to employ tools to determine the orbits of solar system debris. So those questions, questions like them, and questions that arise um, inevitably during LSST operations or concurrent with its operations um, are things that, that we need to be thinking about now and developing and sharing the right uh, tools and analysis methods to employ. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, how does, does LINK fit in to community preparations and perhaps assist those preparations? Well, vast improvements in technology, even just over the last few years now make it possible to envision easily sharing full end-to-end -end analyses and expertise, not just data and tools, but entire pipelines. And that in turn leads to reproducibility. It leads to the option to build upon past work and to make it our own. So we no longer have to accept the frustrations of breakdowns due to changes in an operating system or a compiler or a relevant data set or library. Um, we have virtual machines and clusters in the cloud that make computational storage and power available over many configurations to many users. Um, a personalizable workbench now makes it possible uh, to move beyond simply reproducing past work um, and instead making it our own. And incorporating open source code and databases allow us flexibility and to save time uh, without necessarily being black boxes. So being able to reproduce and then scale up or build on past analyses leads to an enhancement in the credibility and impact of both the original work and work that draws from it. And these should encourage folks in the community to buy in um, and expand our user community beyond the traditional R1 research centers. Those options in turn are going to generate more tools, more expertise, and more discoveries. So Link is seeking to drive this change through dedicated software, a dedicated cyber infrastructure group, funded community workshops, incubators, a large steady visitor program, and lots of training. So one problem, if I could have the next slide, please, that researchers, particularly junior researchers in our community face is that they often complain, rightly so, of spending too little time doing creative work and much more time duplicating each other's efforts. So writing similar pipelines, tracking down the latest versions of code, struggling to scale up, worrying about compatibility, searching for the right computational facilities, et cetera. 
uh, some decide it's not even worth the bother in the first place. And the price for entry for those outside R1 institutions or in traditionally underrepresented groups is even higher. So LINK seeks to train and mentor researchers everywhere uh, to share analyses and tools. And we think that enabling this broader access to new expertise and pipelines, computational power, um, will lead to more discoveries and is something in which we should be investing a lot of our time. So with that, um, we'd like to move into a discussion of the details of LANK, uh, starting with the software development program and timeline, and then proceeding to the training and mentorship program. So I'll let Rachel take it away at the next slide. Rachel, you're muted at the moment. That's great. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, we're very happy to announce that the Schmidt Features Foundation has recently approved funding for a software infrastructure development project that will fill a major capability gap in community analysis software for LSST. The scale and complexity of LSST data demand high quality, robust analysis software frameworks to enable your scientific discovery. The framework should be based on industry standard tools using professional software engineering practices. They should make use of common technical solutions to computational challenges that cut across diverse science cases. And they should thereby enable development of analysis tools that efficiently access and operate on the LSST data. So just to give an example of what I mean by, by all of that so far, if 20 different groups working in four different LSST science collaborations want to carry out efficient analyses of huge numbers, you know, billions of light curves, for example, running machine learning classification algorithms, then it doesn't really make sense for the researchers in those 20 groups and four science collaborations to separately develop their own methods for optimizing the storage, access, and manipulation of light curves. It may not even be feasible, depending on the resources available to each group. So if those groups can develop the tools to do their science, within a framework that includes the infrastructure for optimized light curve storage access and manipulation, they'll all be able to do their science much more efficiently and robustly than they could otherwise, and will be better placed to share insights and tools and to compare results with each other. So that's just one example of how common infrastructure with professional quality technical solutions for computational challenges can serve the entire community. Other important features is the software should be open source with curated documentation and examples so that it's easy for people to adopt it. The software should be deployable on both the cloud and high performance computing systems. And it should be interoperable with the Rubin Science Platform and more generally with, uh, with, with data access tools provided by Rubin Observatory. So with support from the Schmidt Features Foundation, we will develop open scalable and extensible analysis frameworks that satisfy the conditions listed on this slide and make them freely available to the astrophysics community. So uh, just a few features of this program. Uh, work will be carried out by an agile team of software engineers and support scientists at Carnegie Mellon University and at the University of Washington. The support scientists, um, including some at University of Pittsburgh, uh, will serve as the interface to the science community. For example, helping others to implement their own analysis tools within the framework, curating documentation and demos and, and so on. The initial work will focus on three frameworks, solar system science, analysis of time series data, and photometric redshift development and validation. There is significant funding that will enable LSSTC to administer community engagement programs at all phases of this project. And you'll hear more about that in Andy Connolly's talk later in this session. Finally, the program includes both funded and in-kind computing resources, which will enable early adoption and application of the software to precursor data sets and to early LSST data by the community. And we're especially fortunate for some um, significant in-kind computing resources from the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center uh, in the early phases of the project. So this is a five-year project divided roughly into two parts. The initial design and implementation phase will last two years, 
followed by about three years of further development and improvement based on community feedback. The transition between those two phases roughly corresponds to the start of LSST. We anticipate enabling and supporting beta testers to do science with precursor data sets in early phases of the work as early as the second year of the project. In later phases, the software development will be driven by people doing science, not only with precursor data sets, but also with early LSST data. Before I finish, I'd like to just conclude with three relevant features of this software program. So the first one is that the software development program is an integral part of LINK and its success will be supported by that broader effort, getting guidance from the LINK advisory committee, but also the interaction between the software program, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the postdoctoral program that you'll hear about um, from Geno, the engagement with the science community and the LSST science collaborations that you'll hear about from Andy, and long-term support for use of the software, which you'll hear about from Adam Bolton. Uh, the, the second thing I wanted to point out is that by providing open source software along with support for its adoption, this program will create a more equitable scientific landscape, enabling groups with fewer resources to carry out powerful analyses of LSST data. And the final point is that this program is going to serve as a multiplier on institutional foundation and federal funding streams that support scientists to, to, to carry out their analyses. If, if there's a grant or some startup funds being used to support a student, they will have professional software engineering solutions for some of the major computational challenges, and they'll be able to focus on you know, developing their photometric redshift estimation method or their machine learning classifier. So to conclude, I'm really excited about this newly approved software development program, and I hope that you all are too. As Anne mentioned in her talk, LINK includes not only support for community software development, but also training opportunities for early career scientists. So our next speaker is Adam Miller, who is going to talk about an existing training program, the LSSTC Data Science Fellowship Program. Thank you for that introduction, Rachel. So today I'm gonna to talk about an existing program and one that has served in some ways as a model for some of the aspects of LINK that we're talking about today. May we advance to the next slide, please? So it's long been recognized that the data rate and data volume that are gonna be produced by the Rubin Observatory uh, far exceed what astronomers were traditionally looking at. And in particular, if you consider curricula in graduate programs five or 10 years ago, also exceeds the type of training that is typically given to graduate students. And so it, it was, realized that uh, practical applications of data science to you know, petabyte scale data sets was not something for which we had uh, scores and scores of junior scientists ready to adopt. And so uh, hoping to fill this need, the LSSTC Data Science Fellowship Program was conceived. So this is a training program for graduate students. Uh, if you're curious to learn more details, you can visit our website at astrodatascience.org. But this program was essentially designed to prepare students to be leaders in uh, large data science methods uh, in advance of Rubin Observatory, and then hopefully also training students during operations of the Rubin Observatory as well. Um, historically, I just wanna quickly note that the DSFP was the first large initiative from the LSSTC Corporation. And uh, as such, some of the positive aspects from the program, again, have been a bit of a model for how LINK is being built. Uh, may we move to the next slide, please? So just really quickly, the DSFP trains students, but it also serves to connect people and institutions. Briefly, the program has uh, fellows that attend six sessions over the course of two years. Every year, 20 new fellows are admitted as a new cohort, and these students come from across the globe. The sessions themselves are hosted by different LSSTC member institutions, and those institutions, in turn, get to have four of their students attend the session during which the DSFP is visiting. We have guest instructors that provide lectures on the data science topics that we cover. Uh, as well as providing problems for the students to work on in a hands-on setting. So um, students aren't just listening or watching lectures, they also have a chance to use the um, tools that they are being instructed about 
while uh, developing their skills with the other members of the program. So as I said a moment ago, the main goal here was to train the next generation of astro data scientists. And a big emphasis in the DSFP is to do that within a supportive community. We accomplish that in part by having overlapping cohorts. So students are in the program for two years, but there's new members every year. And that both uh, preserves the institutional knowledge for how the training should be advanced, as well as strengthening our community. Um, we use a unique admissions procedure, which is designed to diversify our cohorts over multiple axes. Um, in particular, we're selecting students from all sorts of subfields that are going to be uh, addressed by the Rubin Observatory. We're also getting students at different phases in their grad uh, program, as well as different levels of computing experience, et cetera. Um, those of you that may be interested in the program, our next round of admissions is going to be in uh, the spring of 2022. Um, may we go to the next slide, please? So. In thinking about LINK and ways in which the DSFP has served as an inspiration for this new program that we're announcing today, um, both of these things are large initiatives from the LSST Corporation, which are specifically designed to promote readiness for Rubin data. Uh, and that includes uh, community software, like we just heard about, fellowships like the DSFP and a postdoctoral fellowship that you're about to hear about. Uh, as well as other training opportunities that will be offered to the community. Um, both of these programs are working to build a very strong network. Uh, this includes things like uh, incubators and hack weeks. Those again will be discussed in uh, Andy's talk in just a moment, as well as workshops that provide training, um, as well as moving people to different institutions where the development of the community software is happening. Um, both programs provide training and mentorship for junior scientists, again, promoting readiness and uh, training the next generation to be able to maximally use all of the data that's going to be coming from the Rubin Observatory. And in just a second, we're going to hear about the LSSTC postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, and then finally, both programs are hoping to foster a strong community uh, and improve inclusiveness in our field. So we're doing this by connecting institutions. The open computing resources that we just heard about uh, will develop equity. And these fellowships uh, bring people together in cohorts that uh, create friendships and networks that do last for a lifetime. So uh, I now I'm going to pass things over to Jenna, who's going to tell us about the LSSTC postdoctoral fellowships. Thanks, Adam. So as you've heard, a postdoc fellowship program is a fantastic way to accomplish some of the goals of LINK. That is starting, um, fostering some of the early discovery in the early years of the survey, spreading knowledge and expertise out into the community and um, building networks. So next slide, please. On Tuesday, we'll actually have an entire hour on just this fellowship program. So today what I'm gonna do is actually just give you one slide of an overview of the top level points, and then one slide reminding you or showing you how it fits into LINK. So basically come tomorrow to learn more about this, but for now, let me just tell you that the fellowship that we will be launching is one that will be competitive with other top fellowships that you might be familiar with in the astrophysics community. So fellows will have complete research freedom within the context of that research being connected to this facility, competitive stipends, competitive research allowances, and in some case go beyond the standard fellowship terms and offer four-year terms. Each year, our selection committees will strive to build cohorts that are excellent, diverse, and also balanced. And these will be um, consist of five astrophysicists each year. So we have funding in um, promised for the first two cohorts, and we're very optimistic based on our conversations with some potential funders that we will be able to continue this program beyond those first two cohorts. Moreover, the fellows will have a very large choice of host institutions. So fellows will be able to, first of all, I should say they, they can come from anywhere 
no matter what your institution is inside or outside the US, whether or not it has LSST data rights, that doesn't matter. You can apply for this fellowship or your student can apply for this fellowship. Um, there's a large choice of host institutions where the fellows will be able to conduct their research. They will, most of them will do their work at one of the LSSTC member institutions. There are about 30 of those, although I should say that some of those members of LSSTC are actually consortia of institutions. So that ends up providing quite a large variety of institutions for fellows to choose from. Some are inside the US and some are outside of the US. So you can get this, take this fellow fellowship to um, an institution that is outside the US, which is fairly unusual. Um, one of the fellows each year, one of the astrophysics fellows will sit at what we're calling an expansion site. The goal of these sites are that they would be, um, again, consistent with some of our core values that you've heard articulated throughout this talk of diversity and inclusiveness. Um, one of the fellows will sit at a small or historically underserved institution uh, within the US. And um, those fellows will actually receive some additional research funding and four-year fellowship terms in order to carry out their work and uh, also help faculty and students at those institutions participate fully in LSST. So some of these are fairly standard properties of a fellowship, you know, being able to have a large choice of host institution, freedom, and a good stipend. But this fellowship has more than that. Um, for one thing that's very unusual, it's cross-disciplinary. So for every five astrophysics fellows, there we will also uh, fund one or two social science fellows. And those fellows will conduct their research on the practice of science within the LSST research and community. And they will um, strive to investigate such topics as what makes an inclusive research environment or an inclusive collaboration or team. And also how do um, early career research adapt in an environment where there's uh, this huge influx of a new type of data and new software, like some of the products that Rachel was describing. In addition to being cross-disciplinary, this fellowship will have another exciting aspect that I think some other fellowships don't have, and that is it will contain stru structured mentorship and leadership training. So each fellow, they won't be just tossed off onto their own, they will actually have, be invited to put together a collaboration and mentoring committee. And those are of senior researchers who will be focused on helping the fellow in various ways in their career through networking, advising, both in terms of professional and scientific issues that come up and to ensure that at least that some of those mentors have the time to really invest in the fellows two of them will also receive some funding through this program. It's two members of each of these collaboration and mentorship committees, which is, a, I think, a very novel way to approach something like this. Again, more details will be provided on Tuesday, so please do come to that session if you're interested or if you know someone who you think should be applying for one of these fellowships. In terms of timelines, look at um, the LSSTC website around September for the first formal announcement and application webpage. The first set of applications will be due in November, and those will be for fellowships starting in the fall of 2022. Rachel, could I have the next, my second slide? Thanks. So people have been saying these programs are all, oh, I see I have a two minute warning. Good, thanks, David. Um, these programs are all connected. In particular, the postdoc fellowship program is connected to LINK in several ways. One of the most obvious ones is fellows that elect to go to these handful of institutions that have been working so tirelessly to create this program. Those are Carnegie Mellon, Northwestern, University of Arizona, or University of Washington will be offered four-year terms. And the goal of those terms, the reason, or the in intent behind those is that for fellows who wanna be deeply involved in helping develop or beta test tools, they shouldn't be penalized in their career. So having four years gives them time to both work on software and publish. So they're set up in an excellent position for the next job. They'll also be part of Link scientific 
leadership in terms of scientific organizing committees, invited to participate on those things, and also be part of the link community. Fellows and their local advisors will be invited to participate in things like monthly topical group meetings run by link personnel. So this is all, you can see how this postdoc fellowship, I hope, connects some of the core aspects of the software program with the broader community. And now I'm happy to pass the table over to the floor to Andy to talk a little more about community engagement. Uh, thanks, Jenna. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So as Rachel said at the start of the session, um, our goal with Link is to build some of the tools and the software infrastructure to enable all of our science um, uh, with, with tools that are designed to scale to the size and the complexity of the data that's going to be coming from Ruben, the LSST data. Uh, and and the, the objective behind this is to make it easier, not necessarily easier, easy, but easier whether you're a graduate student that's part of the Data Science Fellowship Program or an LSSTC postdoctoral fellow or any researcher who's part of the Rubin community to undertake the science that you want to do with the Rubin data. So um, in, in thinking about LINK to help shape the design and implementation, we've been creating a set of community engagements, um, ones that allow for um, how our science ideas are going to change and evolve um, as we uh, face the onslaught of the, of the Rubin data. So I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about, um, about these different science engagements over the next few slides. But the, the primary components to this are um, a science analysis platform um, that will enable researchers to utilize their scalable analysis tools um, from Link in preparation for the Rubin Science Platform. Uh, the science platform that we're talking about will be built on, um, uh, on uh, Jupyter Hub. And as you can see on the right-hand side of this figure, we've been deploying some of these prototype platforms uh, to host hack weeks for science collaborations over the last few months um, already, including um, uh, hack weeks that have been hosted by the Solar System Science Collaboration. And our goal is to roll this out for all of the science collaborations, um, as I said, in preparation for when we all transition to the Rubin Science Platform. We'll provide compute resources to ensure that the community can start their science with precursor data sets. And the initial idea here is to have about a couple of million CPU hours uh, a year available for early science, with the hope that that will grow as we move towards uh, closer to Rubin operations. And then to build a set of programs that include design workshops, incubators, hack weeks. Um, and these are, we're trying to use these to shape and to test and to evaluate the tools and infrastructure that we're going to be building as part of Link. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so the initial design workshops will start this fall. Um, members of the design teams will be drawn from the full Rubin Science community and the uh, science collaborations. And the, the objective here is to try and shape and prioritize what are the tool sets that are needed by the different science collaborations as a function of time, in, in particular over the next 12 months or so. Um, and we'll draw a lot of that from the both the, the science um, uh, roadmaps and also the software roadmaps that have come from the different science collaborations. Funding is available for travel, assuming that we are able to do these um, design workshops in person. Uh, funding is available for travel people to actually attend the workshops. And then we expect to hold a second set of uh, design workshops about three years into the LINK program. And the idea here is this is as we begin to enter Rubin operations and we begin to get a better understanding of the capabilities of the Rubin data, we want to revisit what tools we've actually developed for scalable science. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, the, uh, as we get ready to, to release the beta versions of some of the tools that we'll be building towards the end of the first year, um, our goal is to run a program of incubators. Um, incubators you can think of as a three month long collaboration between a research team and a research team could be um, a postdoc, it could be faculty with graduate students, it could be a subset of a science collaboration coming together to write a proposal to say they want to work on a particular um, science analysis. 
Um, and the idea here is that uh, you work in collaboration with the software engineers and the research scientists working with Link. And the goal is for, uh, by working with this, um, with the, the Link software engineers over, over a few months, it, it could be that you can um, undertake a particular science goal. And this may be that you want to run an analysis on Ruben light curves or a precursor data set. Um, to do a particular science analysis on the uh, on the light curves. It could be that you will have a, an algorithm that you want to apply to a data set and you need to be able to scale that out to the size and volume of uh, we expect from Ruben. And so the um, these incubators may um, may lead to science results with precursor data or they may lead to a point where a research team is in a position to write an NSF proposal or write a proposal to another agency based on a set of preliminary results. We expect to run about, um, or we anticipate running about six incubators a year. Uh, and each of these incubators will come with a small research grant of about $20,000. And the idea here is this should be able to offset some of the travel costs or provide support for graduate students or summer salaries for faculty. Um, and the research team just determines how they want to actually spend those resources. And all of the incubator programs will come with the compute resources necessary to um, accomplish the, um, that particular incubator. So we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, um, and the, uh, the last component that we've been talking about in terms of um, the uh, science engagement or community engagement are hack weeks. And here, what we're trying to do is to broaden the engagement of the Ruben community with the tools and infrastructure that we've built. And the current plan is to run these for the last three years of the program. So starting in the end of the second year of Link, the, the Hack Weeks will be hosted around the country. Again, travel support will be available for all Hack Week attendees. Um, and the idea is if we, run, if, we, if we run them around the country, potentially internationally as well, then everybody has a chance to actually come together to experiment with some of the Link tools. All of the details of the programs that we've talked about over the last um, uh, 30 minutes um, or so, and I, I should really emphasize that these are the uh, community engagement programs that are funded as of today. And we hope to be able to roll out more programs as we seek funding to support Link and, and, the, and the Ruben Science community. But all of the details of what we've been talking about today will be available um, on a website um, that we intend to launch um, in, in early September. And the last point I'd like to make is that when we're doing the selection process, building off what happened with the data science fellowship programs, um, we will be selecting the, the participants in these programs in, in a manner to try and ensure that the participants represent a, a, a diverse um, and, and, and inclusive and are an inclusive part of our community. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce Adam Bolton, who's the director of the CSDC at Noir Lab to talk about uh, Noir Lab's partnership with the LINK program. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to give this perspective on support for the LINK project from the Community Science and Data Center at NSF's Noir Lab, um, with a particular focus on the software component of LINK. So if we could go to the next slide. NORLAB is NSF's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory. Uh, it's a new multi-mission center launched in October of 2019 that combines the operations of all major NSF facilities for ground-based optical and infrared astronomy. Uh, this includes operations of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, as well as the Gemini Observatory and the facilities previously operated by the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, AKA NOAO. Uh, partnerships are really central to the lab's activities. Uh, most prominent are the partnership with DOE and SLAC to operate Rubin Observatory, uh, and also the International Gemini Partnership. Uh, Kit Peak and Cerro Tololo also host major DOE and NASA-funded projects, uh, as well as the SOAR and WIN Observatory Consortia. Uh, the Noir Lab mission statement is shown here. It emphasizes our role as a science-enabling platform for the curiosity-driven research of the astronomical community, uh, as well as our commitment to make this platform accessible to all astronomers from all institutions, demographics, career stages, uh, and science interests. Uh, the mission statement also highlights how we see data products and data services as being of equal importance with observatories for enabling discoveries in, in modern astronomy. Uh, next slide, please. 
So motivated by that central role of data to modern astronomy research, uh, the Community Science and Data Center, or CSDC, is the home to Noir Lab's initiatives to make data-intensive astronomy research accessible to the broadest possible community of astronomers. Uh, to give a couple examples, this includes the development and operation of the Astro Data Lab Science Platform, which currently enables research with large public data sets coming from Noir Lab's four-meter telescopes. Uh, and which in the future will become interoperable with the Rubin Science Platform uh, to enable scientists to combine LSST data with uh, data from other major surveys. Uh, it also includes the Antares Event Broker, which is a software system that will allow astronomers to implement their own filters of the Rubin Alert Stream and to be notified in real time of transient and variable objects of interest uh, for rapid follow up, observing, and uh, further study. Uh, Antares is operating now with public Zwicky transient facility alert streams. Uh, I, I point these out in particular because I like to draw the analogy that scientific software systems in the data intensive astronomy era are very much like instruments in the classical astronomy sense. So for instance, we like to think of Antares as a software instrument that will connect to the Rubin alert stream uh, and allow users to conduct scientific research. Uh, and just like many different physical instruments can connect to the Gemini telescope focal planes, many different software instruments can connect to data from Rubin. Uh, next slide, please. So continuing the analogy, this uh, major gift from the Schmidt Futures Foundation is funding the creation of a new uh, software instrument suite, if you will, that will enable new research across multiple domains of astrophysics, as Rachel described in her talk. Uh, we at CSDC are really excited to be able to partner with the LINK project uh, to bring this new research capability to the Noir Lab user community. Um, practically, that means we will embed Noir Lab software engineers during the LINK design and development phase uh, to ensure that the LINK software works with the broader portfolio of Noir Lab software systems and data sets. Uh, we'll provide user support and training when the tools are in operation, uh, and we'll work with link scientists and engineers to maximize the long-term sustainability of the linked software toolkit. Um, for the research community, this is really a great opportunity now to influence the development direction from a very early stage. Uh, I certainly encourage everyone to follow up on the link community engagement opportunities that Andy described. Uh, on the Noir Lab side, we will be sponsoring a community workshop sometime in the coming year on implementation of decadal survey priorities in astronomical data science. Uh, and I'll also give a plug for nominations and expressions of interest for a Noir Lab data science advisory group, which we will soon be convening through CSDC. Uh, and that's an opportunity to influence Noir Lab's support for data-driven research in all areas, uh, including our engagement with the LINK project. Uh, please do feel free to reach out to me directly with any questions you may have uh, and, and keep an eye out for a, for a formal announcement of that pretty soon. So with that, I think we can go to the closing slide and I'll hand the mic over to David McFarland to facilitate the next part of this session. Thank you, Adam. Um, so I hope uh, everyone has received the takeaway message here that LINK is designed to build upon and complement the significant federal investments that have been made and are being made in Rubin construction and operations. And we hope it will benefit every one of you in the ways that have been described over the last half hour or so. Um, so I open all segments of this presentation to questions. Uh, there is at least one in the chat window I see. So Paulina, maybe you would like to follow up with your question about the terms for the fellowship with Jenna. Hello. Uh, yes, I was interested if what I understand that the aim of these programs is uh, broader than astrophysics. So I was thinking that in other disciplines, they don't do not necessarily get a PhD. So for example, in social sciences you mentioned, so if these applications will be um, uh, you will accept applications for persons who does not have a PhD. Um, our, our intent is for this mostly to be a postdoctoral type program. So um, that said, we're generally interested in hearing about special circumstances. So we would be open if someone has one, um, but our, our intent really is for this to be a postdoctoral, and in some cases for the social scientists, a junior faculty program. 
So if you have something specific in mind, please be in touch with me and, um, you know, we will run it by. We have a nice um, process. We have a steering committee that will be um, considering all kinds of questions that come up. And since we're still building this program, um, these kinds of questions do come up and we'll consider all of them carefully. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Um, follow up on Paulina's question, go ahead. Uh, thank you, yeah, I'm Charles Liu, hi. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, but to follow up, there are many people in my institution or similar, City University of New York and so forth, who aren't going to be able to commit for whatever reason in their careers to PhD programs immediately or even go forward so the pre-doctoral or post-baccalaureate layer is an extremely important part of reaching uh, an underserved community or even a, a served community that has other issues than most research one institutions are able to support. Uh, I was watching, and I think I saw some focus on post-bac or pre-doc folks in the career. Is there something specific for that? Uh, region of uh, our face space of uh, workforce slash student force and so forth? Thanks for that question. I think that's something that would be on our, our long lists of ways to build from what we are starting with. Um, our current focus, as I just mentioned, is on postdocs, but um, obviously, as Adam talked about a supplementary training program for grad students, we would... Uh, definitely consider what would work. And it sounds like what you're talking about, maybe like a bridge program um, mm -hmm. or not even a bridge to PhD, but some post back program. And one thing we're considering working with some programs that are bridge programs to look at their graduates um, and recruit their graduates into our postdoc program. Um, yeah, but, bridge, bridge is a great way to put it, uh, Jenna. My, um, I'm thinking a little bit beyond bridge because that's a specific suggestion for undergraduates who intend to go on to be PhD or are very committed to such an activity. Uh, there are many students uh, and people who are ready to be employed and want to work in the science field and have the expertise to do something at a post-baccalaureate level, but probably will not, at least in the near future, be able to commit to aiming for the PhD. And so, the, the idea is that this workforce pipeline uh, or this area of the workforce is, if there is some sort of um, niche that such people can fill, for example, data analyst at Space Telescope, right, to, to suggest a different sort of um, professional environment. If yeah. that is on the radar, as you're describing, not necessarily for the post back program, but for all link programs, uh, that yeah. would be something that, that would be very valuable, I think, in, in thinking about the next steps. But I, I, if I yeah. missed something, please let me know. No, thanks for that comment. That hadn't yet been on our radar, so I appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, um, I see a question from Constantine in the Slack channel, which sounds like Andy might be the best person to answer. So please go ahead. Uh, thanks, David. Um, so I, I think the, the question is about how, essentially, how do we hook into the uh, Ruben data? Um, I'm, uh, it, it depends a little bit, it's a good question. It depends a little bit on, on, the, um, on the structure and infrastructure that's put in place for the US data facility and the IDAX. Um, I'm gonna actually pass it to Mario, who's been um, mm -hmm. leading some of these thoughts um, to, to talk about some of the different possibilities and then um, jump to um, Adam after that. Yeah, th thanks, Andy. Um, I, I think this is, this is something that Adam uh, uh, already touched upon. Um, the, the, one of the wonderful things that, the, in the way how Ruben is designed, is that virtually all of the data are accessible either through APIs or in some cases through bulk downloads. So if uh, this allows um, one to do science uh, with Rubin data, not just through the Rubin Science platform, but also through Data Lab, through other platforms as well. So in terms of just getting the raw data out, I think there are, there are ways that are already been built into, into Rubin to do it. Um, but I think one of the bigger points I wanna make here is that the, the, the frameworks that uh, we're hoping to build with Link are gonna be designed to run on platforms like the Rubin platform. 
So this may be more of a question of bringing software in rather than, than how we're going to get the, get the data out. So that means you'll be able to you know, hopefully Conda install or you know, Docker pull, uh, whichever framework you're, you're interested in, and then use it right then and there with, uh, with the Ruben data. I can thank you, thank you Mary. maybe just Go ahead. add a little uh, uh, additional context from our side. So yeah, I think uh, some of the, the details are certainly still still to be developed at this stage. Um, just from, from where I'm looking at it, I think uh, at least my expectation is that the connection between Link and the Rubin data facility and science platform um, could very well be done under the Independent Data Access Center framework. Uh, this is a framework that's currently under development and which is motivated uh, so far, at least primarily by the goal of bringing international in-kind contributions of data and computing resources into the fold and making them available to the worldwide Rubin science community. Um, and Noir Lab, we're looking at this approach as the most likely mechanism for connecting Noir Lab's uh, broader suite of data sets and data services uh, to the uh, to the Rubin data science ecosystem. Uh, so I expect this approach would also make a lot of sense for Link. Um, I think another goal on both the Link side and the CSTC side is to maximize our technology alignment and, as Mario mentioned, uh, interoperability with the Rubin Science platform, uh, both in terms of the software components that we select and then also in the, the interface standards that we implement. Okay, thank you, Adam. I don't see any other questions in chat or, or Slack. Still have the opportunity to ask. If not, I'll provoke the team a little bit. Um, maybe you could elaborate a little bit further on, there are a set of uh, science collaborations that have been active preparing for LSST data analysis for quite some time. How do you see that relationship working within the context of incubators and workshops, et cetera, and connecting to the link software teams a little bit more specifically than was touched upon during the presentation? And uh, I don't know, maybe that's an Andy question as well, or, or Rachel. Uh, I, I could make a start at it and then Andy could follow up maybe. Sure. Um, so the LSST science collaborations are a really important part of the user community. And so we're, we've given a lot of thought to how we can provide opportunities and resources to enable them to engage uh, at all phases. So in the context of, for example, design workshops, what that might mean is explicitly having some participants who are selected to represent um, specific science collaborations and given the, you know, the travel support to enable them to engage and, and to do so. Um, in the context of incubators, um, as Andy mentioned during his talk, the groups engaging in incubators could be of different sorts. They could be, you know, a faculty member and a grad student together, or it could be a few people in a science collaboration who banded together, you know, and, and said, well, you know, we have this great analysis we want to do as, as part of this program. So there, the mapping is not totally clear, but I, I think the, um, the main point, I guess, is that we are trying to ensure that a diverse set of people across many areas, including science topics and science collaborations, can engage in the incubators as well. And so that might play a role in which of the groups that you know, propose uh, to join the incubator program are selected. Um, Andy, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? I think that, that that's that's pretty comprehensive. The um, I, I'd say that a, a lot of work has gone on in the science collaborations already in terms of scoping out what are the what are the major challenges, um, what are the computational resources, not to access the data that uh, Ruben's going to be providing, but to be able to take some of that data and be able to run a, um, a fairly complex um, analysis at scale, and so. Um, and so we'll we'll be um, engaging pretty heavily with uh, with the science collaborations and anyone who really wants to um, to kind of articulate um, what what are the computational challenges that they're facing um, in order to uh, both design what the frameworks will look like and also to understand how do we prioritize them, particularly in the first year of the development. 
Thanks, Andy. Um, Leanne, would you like to comment or add to that discussion? Uh, no, I have nothing to add. Um, okay. Was there something else you would like to raise? You raised your hand. Oh, I did. It was a comment about one of Andy's slides before, but I've sort of lost the train now, so maybe I'll, I'll pick okay. it up on Andy. Okay. Uh, this may overlap with the discussion we just had, but um, you outlined three initial development themes for the software projects. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit to the importance of those themes and how this might evolve over time. You talk, spoke a little bit to that, but it might be worth emphasizing the dynamic nature of Flink and you know, future development opportunities. <clears throat> that could be Andy or Rachel, I suspect. Um, okay, well, maybe I'll just take one example. Um, uh, and, and I think one of the important things is, is the collaboration between this um, and the, not just the Rubin community, but also the Rubin project as well. But one, one example is an initiative that has been um, started by Rubin in terms of um, uh, how, how do we manage photometric redshifts? And um, how do, if, if Rubin is producing a single realization of a photometric redshift that is meant to support the majority of the community, what happens if you have a photo ret photometric redshift algorithm that you wish to be able to, that you, you want to develop or optimize for your particular science case? Maybe you're looking to high redshift galaxies. Maybe you want to measure the luminosity function as a function of uh, redshift um, for different galaxy populations. Um, having the, the resources in place to be able to develop that algorithm uh, will require having training samples, it will require being able to validate and test um, the application of the photometric redshift algorithm. And it'll be, it also requires to be able, ideally, to be able to store the outputs uh, and, and allow potentially others to actually connect with those outputs. And, and so putting together some of these, um, the infrastructure in place to enable a typical user to be able to develop their own photometric redshift, I think is, is um, is uh, it kind of demonstrating the added value that we're going to be that we're trying to actually build. Um, I think we all recognize that the, the tools that we're going to need today working with precursor data sets are going to be very different from the ones that we need at the instant that Rubin turns on or potentially two to three years into when Rubin's being operated because we better understand the data themselves. Um, and so but that's why we had this kind of phased approach of design workshops, working with um, kind of almost like trusted testers to evaluate what we're doing, um, broadening out to the bigger community and then running another cycle of these design workshops so that we can allow the tools, tools to evolve as the, the science will evolve with them. I don't know if Rachel wants to add on to anything. Um, I would just add, um, I think you hit on most of what I would have said I, I would just add that for this this idea of the second round of design workshops after a few years into the program you know it's not just that for a given science theme our ideas of what you know what's the most important what's the needed infrastructure will have changed but also that you know there might be by by that time you know new algorithm development or new ideas of what's important and so just going back to david's question about the themes you know, we'll have an opportunity at that point to reprioritize based on developments in the previous few years, which I think is um, really important. Okay, thank you both. Um, there's one last question from Rachel Street on the Slack channel. So why don't you go ahead, Rachel? So the concern that I have had is that uh, the science collaborations have tried to support the project in many, many different ways. And a lot of people have contributed a huge amount of effort to help not just the success of the project, but also of, to build the uh, preparations for the whole community. Uh, but to do so does risk um, dedicating a lot of service time, of course, detracts from research time. And there is a certain career risk that goes with that. Uh, and it does make me uncomfortable in asking for contributions, especially from junior career people. So I'd like to know 
given the value that the science collaborations provide, how is the LINK program specifically going to um, help those, those people? Should I? Anybody want to field that one, Jenna? Um, I can start. Rachel yeah. knows some of this, but I can maybe make it a little broader than the postdoc program. I think part of our goal at LINK is to not ask for any service from the science collaborations and uh, instead to seek funding to help the science collaborations, in particular, like early career um, researchers. And that's why, for example, in the postdoc program, as you know, we are made an effort to get funding to support members of the science collaboration uh, who work with postdocs and also build a role for them so that they can perhaps su suggest coll collaborations to postdocs that would also um, help them um, help the member of the science collaboration advance their goals by bringing a postdoc on board and uh, helping them. So you, you're already aware of that. I know, Rachel, in terms of the postdoc program, but I think overall, um, as, as LINK, our, our goal is to not ask the science collaborations for service, but definitely to think about what would help the science collaborations and the members of those collaborations advance in their career. And what where is funding needed? Like what particular kind of funding and where at what point, and to keep thinking that way as we move forward. Um, Rachel, did you want to address that question as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said. I thought maybe I could just give um, one, you know, small example of how those principles have been, you know, how we're thinking of implementing that in practice. So like to give an example of just going back to the incubator programs that Andy was talking about, so um, if a member of a science collaboration, you know, wants to contribute to developing an analysis tool that, um, that a science collaboration really needs, you know, for to achieve its science goals so as part of its like preparatory work for the survey, um, you know, they, they would um, propose to be a part of this incubator program, right? And if they're selected, they would have um, a small grant to, provide them either travel support or some amount of salary support uh, in that endeavor. But also the goal is to give them computing resources so they could run that analysis on a precursor data set and write a paper, right? And so there, you know, there would be resources in, <clears throat> excuse me. So the idea, again, just this goes back to what Jenna said, trying to provide opportunities and resources for people as they are engaging in that preparatory work. And again, that's just one example, but it gives a sense of the flavor of our thinking. Okay, thanks, Rachel and Jenna. Um, so we're eating into the break period at this point. So I think I'll call the Q&A session to a close. Uh, I'm sure any one of the five speakers would be happy to field inquiries by email or direct contact. Um, so as we continue to implement and develop this program, uh, we're very much interested in your questions and, uh, and thoughts about the program. Uh, let me also finish by advertising, uh, re-advertising what Jeno brought up. There is a session tomorrow afternoon at 1.15 where the LSSTC Catalyst Fellowship that she described will be introduced in more detail. And so anybody that's interested in that program, I would recommend trying to attend that session tomorrow afternoon. And with that, uh, I think we can bring the session to a close. And thanks everyone for attending. We're all very excited about this uh, program and its imminent launch. And we think it'll have major impact on the science output from LSST. So thanks everyone. <laughs>